All right, folks, we'll go ahead and get started tonight. Thank you for being faithful. This is that, this is that evening that we, we had the extra hour, but now we're yucky tonight because it got dark quick. So anyway, uh, I guess we enjoy it while we can. Uh, for those of you who are on Facebook Live with us tonight, thank you for tuning in, and we appreciate that very, very much. Um, there was a couple of things that I uh, just wanted to share with you as far as some announcements. The uh, yellow sheet that was in your bulletin today, this is our, uh, um, I believe Committee on Committees is or not committee, not committee on committees, I'm at another church now, nominating committee. And um, if you're interested in serving in some capacity, we will give you the opportunity to pick first, second, and third choices if you would like. Or if there's just one that you uh, seem to be interested in, give us your name and a cell number, and uh, we will make sure we contact you. We try to uh, do everything we can to help people uh, fit where they need to be. Uh, the church offices are going to be closed tomorrow afternoon. We're doing our staff, we're doing our 2024 planning meeting. And when we do the whole year, it takes a while for 2024. So uh, anyway, if, uh, if you happen to show up tomorrow afternoon, we're not going to be here. Uh, we'll be hiding somewhere. Uh, shoebox uh, packing uh, party is Saturday, November the 11th, next Saturday, and that's the Operation Christmas Child Shoebox. The uh, packing party begin at 10 a.m. Our uh, discipleship first uh, classes, like tonight, will end next Sunday, I guess. I didn't realize that. And then we'll resume back in January. I thought we were going a little further. No, that's right. Okay. Uh, Deacon nomination forms are out there if you... Uh, feel led to uh, fill out one of those forms, uh, somebody that you believe would fit the category uh, of being a deacon in our church, uh, we ask that you prayerfully consider it, contact the individual to make sure that they would be interested, and uh, so remember that. Next Sunday, we will not be here. We will dismiss so that you can be at the community-wide Thanksgiving service, and this uh, coming Sunday night, it's at 6 o'clock. It's at Foundations Free Will Baptist out on the highway, go north out of town. Oh, sorry, Sunday, November the 19th, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself, I know. I'm trying to get there, hang on. So, two weeks from tonight, apologize for that. Uh, there will be a time for worship, preaching, and a report from our Minister Alliance. And so, <coughs> if you would... Uh, I want to encourage you, if you've never been to one, it's good uh, as far as the community coming together. Uh, Brother Robert Carter at, from Trinity Baptist Church will be doing the preaching. I'm trying to remember somebody else is doing the worship, not uh, Foundation Street Will Baptist. Cornerstone, thank you. Thomas is keeping me in line tonight. So uh, Cornerstone Church will be providing the worship and encourage you to be a part of that if you would. Uh, we are having our own community Thanksgiving meal Monday, November the 20th. And we need volunteers to help serve. And food assignments should be in your Sunday school books. Now, I, I heard a while ago that some of you, uh, one of the classes, or at least one, did not get an assignment. If you didn't, uh, let the church know. You didn't see them? Well, they were invisible. Uh, we oh. did anybody get them in their classes? Thomas. Okay, see Thomas. Yeah, he can't. He doesn't know everything, does he? We'll check on that. Uh, Terry had a lot going on this past week. We had the women's conference and everything else. So. We'll check and see on that, but we will definitely have them in there. If, you want, if you're kind of curious about that, contact the church office. Just not tomorrow afternoon, uh, but contact Terry, and she'll let you know, okay? And then Brother Matt and the adult choir will be uh, doing the Christmas cantata on Sunday, December the 3rd. 
And that's also the day that we have our international missions banquet that evening. Is that correct? Five o'clock. Uh, Brother uh, Director of Missions, Dr. Scott Hill, his daughter Amber uh, from Venezuela or Argentina, one of the two. Is it? Brazil, sorry. South America. I'm having a rough day today, folks. Um, she's in South America. I don't know. Well, she's not in South America because she's here. Uh, but she will be speaking, and we have not heard her since um, she was in China the last time. And we weren't able to say that because we couldn't tell you where she was at. But uh, they had to leave because of the unrest there. And so she has been reassigned. So we're looking forward uh, to hearing a report from her. So remember that. And that's always a good time that our women on missions do a great job with that. So do we know what we're having yet? Brisket. Now that's my kind of banquet. Yes. All right. I believe... Um, our thrift shop work day on the back there, it says Saturday, November the 11th from 9.30 to 3.30. Um, was that this birthday party, November the 11th from 11 to 2? Was that, uh, I thought that was a surprise. Maybe it's not. Obviously not now. Well, anyway, remember that, okay? So, Betty. All right, I believe that's everything that I needed to share about announcements to you. Uh, as far as our prayer list tonight, I had a couple of additions. Uh, Sherry uh, Fries um, has a growth in her neck or on her neck, and they're, they're going to do a scan Wednesday, so we, they've asked for prayer. I shared uh, with some individuals today that uh, Ruth Graham was taken to the ER uh, this morning. Uh, but it was uh, another situation where uh, the, the antibiotics that they gave her, they didn't check, and it was the antibiotics. She, uh, she does not respond well to certain antibiotics, and it causes other things to happen. So they know what's going on there now. So she is home, but it's going to take about a week to get that out of her system. So if you would, please remember Ruth tonight in your prayers. Uh, she's been going through a lot in dealing with... Um, Wayne's mother, they have been obviously trying to keep her at home and everything, so just pray for that situation. Uh, some of our other church family, Helen Bolton, uh, they've called hospice in. Uh, she goes up and down uh, with her health, but I will tell you that I, since I saw her Thursday, I believe it was, and um, uh, she has gone down since I had seen her the previous week and a half ago before that, so just remember Jack and the family during this time. Uh, let's remember the Bruns tonight. And it's good to see Trisha Beard with us here tonight. Trish, good to see you. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, she is uh, doing much better. We praise the Lord for that. Uh, been praying for Philip Burton. Uh, Philip has just been having a little bit of issues uh, with uh, the, that procedure that they did and uh, just healing. Sometimes he doesn't listen to the doctor very well. And the real reason why I'm telling you that tonight is I told it before I told you. So uh, that's Dr. Pasley giving his advice. Uh, Robert Castleman was here today. It's been a while since Robert has been with us. And he sat back there on the back. So it was good to see him. Continue to pray for him. Rita Cunningham, the Double Ds, let's remember them. Clyde and Claudine Hill were to here today. I didn't realize they were until after the fact, but that was the first, uh, this is the first Sunday they've been here since their car accident. So we praise the Lord that they were able to be with us. Uh, Sandy Lemons continuing to deal with her um, stage four breast cancer. And uh, so just remember her tonight. Uh, Vera Trout, as I shared with you Wednesday night, her and her daughter Leslie uh, have COVID. Uh, pretty much Leslie has got over hers, and Vera didn't seem to have uh, some of the symptoms. Uh, didn't seem to be so bad. So uh, just remember Vera, they're trying to get her back here to Grove into uh, one of the skilled nursing centers here. 
Uh, so pray uh, for that situation. We obviously want to remember uh, Brian Bishop. Uh, Gary was in the process of coming back this evening uh, from uh, Houston. And then um, Brother Olin uh, Hartman, his friend Harry Slifer was actually supposed to be able to come home today and I, didn't, I haven't had a chance to ask him, but he's been in the hospital since like August, uh, really a long time. I'm sorry? Oh, tomorrow. Okay. Did I get that wrong? Did I get that wrong or I thought he told me this afternoon? Okay. Okay, so I haven't got everything wrong here tonight. All right. Okay. Uh, does anybody know what day it is? Okay. Yeah, Sunday. Yeah, thank you. I think yesterday was a shock to my system. I think that's what it was, yeah. Yeah, I'm still trying to get over that. So, anyway, it'll take a while. That's okay. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, I'd like to, you to turn to Second Samuel chapter 13. We are going to look at tonight one of the individuals that when I was growing up, how many of you remember the big family Bibles that your parents may have had or that you had or have? Uh, we got one not long after Lori and I got married. But we had one in, the, in our home. And uh, I don't know, I, I was, I don't know, I was fascinated by it because it had pictures or paintings uh, in the Old Testament, and then it also had pictures and paintings in the New Testament that depicted certain events. Well, one of the ones that it depicted in the Old Testament was Absalom. And we're going to talk about Absalom tonight. And the picture that I, what I remember is, and I don't, I don't remember if it was a painting or, or a, it probably was a painting, but it shows Absalom, his hair, being caught in a branch. And then here are these soldiers, and they're sticking three uh, spears into him. Okay, and I always and I and I thought that's strange. He had that much hair that he uh, got caught uh, in the thicket or whatever. Um, I really resent that he had that much hair, especially now in my life. But uh, anyway, I will not be hanging from a limb because of that. So I'm I feel pretty good about that. Uh, Charles Sundahl in his book calls Absalom the rebel prince charming. And we're going to look at some scripture tonight to help us uh, kind of get to that point. We're going to look at uh, how Absalom uh, grew up and how some things in his family life, uh, you know, created issues. And it's going to be a tragic story, but it's one that we need to uh, to look at. Now, last week in our last study, David had swept Abigail off her feet and ended up marrying her. He took her to the palace, but she comes to find out reality sets in when she gets to the palace, and she's one of several wives, okay? And not only several wives, but other concubines. David had many qualities in his life, but being a one-woman man was not one of them. Now, there's a passage, uh, you could stay where you're at, but let me just give you some context. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, God commanded the Israel kings to not build harems. Uh, unfortunately, Abigail was one of several wives. Now, here's what Deuteronomy 17, 17 says. He shall not multiply wives for himself. Or else his heart will turn away, or, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself, okay? I don't know where that came about, uh, and I, the wisdom of it. Because, folks, uh, I'm trying not to be too lighthearted with this, but with that many wives comes that many mother-in-laws. Have you ever thought about that? Men? You were going to say what? Well, well, okay, if that's what you want to say. Right now, there seems to be a, um, 
a a show on one of the channels called Sisters, Sister Wives. And it is a Mormon who has five wives. And some of them are sisters. Well, in fact, I think most of them are. Now, I don't know this for a fact. I'm just being told this. Because um, I was kind of Googling some things, and sure enough, that came up. So I've never watched one. Uh, I don't think that... I can't see any wisdom in that, but evidently somebody does. Now, Abigail was one of several wives. Um, uh, Michael uh, or Michal, uh, Ahinoam, those names right there. The Hebrew, like I said, if you're in doubt about Hebrew, uh, uh, talk like a belching camel and you'll get close to it. Okay. Okay. the word, uh, there's another lady by the name of Maha. It looks like Maka, but it's actually pronounced Maha, along with several other wives. Uh, Maha means oppressed. This was Absalom's mother, okay? Uh, it means oppressed. Her name means oppressed. She, was rea- uh, she reared her son by King David. Absalom, the word Absalom, means father of peace. And folks, that name is going to become more ironic as we go through this story tonight, okay? Uh, so, Maha was the daughter of Talmai, who was the king of an important city near the Sea of Galilee. He, and remember his name, uh, Talmai, because he's going to come back up here in a little bit, okay? So, uh, Absalom's childhood... Uh, between Second Samuel chapter three and, or excuse me, yeah, chapter three and chapter thirteen, there's twenty years that transpire between those chapters. Uh, one chapter that we certainly know about is chapter eleven, and it gives us the account of David committing adultery with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uh, we know that to try to cover up his sin, David. Uh, has Uriah put into battle, into the heat of battle, where he is killed. He then takes Bathsheba as his wife, and with her being pregnant, they end up losing the child, and Bathsheba uh, becomes pregnant again. Uh, She becomes one of the wives and has Solomon. And clearly, God is not pleased with this situation. I want you to listen to, you're in chapter 13, but in 2 Samuel 11, 27, when the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, speaking of Bathsheba. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay? That is God's commentary on what David did. Now, David, Psalm 51, if you want to see a repentant heart over the sin of Bathsheba, go read Psalm 51. It's one of the most beautiful psalms in reference to repentance, a prayer, uh, you know, truly of repentance. Uh, but the problem is, is that he had too much, uh, you know, he had committed sins, he had done things that really created issues for him, okay? Um, the Lord passes judgment upon David and his household. In 2 Samuel 12, verses 11 and 12, uh, let's see, I didn't write that one down, so I'm just going to turn to it. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. This is what the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. That's a pretty harsh judgment from the Lord. We're going to find out here in a little bit. It is, it becomes true, okay? Now, when we come to 2 Samuel chapter 13, we find uh, a situation involving Absalom, who's the son of David, and a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, who was the oldest son of David. So, um, Absalom and his sister, they become very close. Um, think about the situation. Multiple wives in the palace. 
Uh, can you imagine Absalom growing up with all of this bickering and fighting and jealousy? Because, folks, let's face it, and this is what happens with this Sisters' Wives show that's out there with the, the Mormon and the Five Wives. Uh, one is going to be uh, looked at care more carefully or shown more attention, and the others are going to feel like they're being shunned or whatever, okay? And so that's not going to create a very good situation. And so the same thing happens here. You've got these multiple children, and there is friction, even in the best of households. Some of you, in raising your children, did your kids always get along with one another? My dad, we had boxing gloves at our house with us three boys. And so dad would let, you know, he, he didn't want us to fist, fist fight necessarily, but he, he would get the boxing gloves out every once in a while when we got upset with one another, and then we'd go after it. Then my sister came along and messed everything up. Never understood that. But anyway, if she's listening tonight, I'll get a call from her later on. Okay, well, let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And just keep that in the context, keep that in your mind. All of these wives, all of this, you know, drama, 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 drama. Okay? We don't know everything that went on. But folks, I think we're going to be able to see through these individuals and the way that they live, we are going to see some situations develop. So here we go. Second uh, Samuel chapter 13, the first two verses. Now it was after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So you've got a half-brother who's in love with his half-sister. Oh boy. Verse 2, Amnon was so frustrated because of his sister Tamar that he made himself ill, for she was a virgin, and it seemed hard to Amnon to do anything to her. All right, so Amnon, David's oldest son, falls in love with his half-sister Tamar. Not a great, not a real good situation there. Uh, in fact, here's what the Word of God says about situations like that. In Leviticus 18, 9, The nakedness of your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether born at home or born outside, their nakedness you shall not uncover. Leviticus 20, 17. If there is a man who takes his sister, his father's daughter or his mother's daughter, so that he sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. And they shall be cut off in the sight of the sons of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He bears his guilt. And then Deuteronomy 27, 22, Cursed is he who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father or of his mother. And all the people said, Amen. So, here's the situation that is developed. Now, there is in between verses 2 and verses 6, uh, Amnon has a friend named Jonadab, uh, Jonadab who has an evil influence and he sets up kind of a situation for uh, Amnon to do something. So let's look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 13 and see what happens. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill when the king came to see him. Amnon said to the king, his dad, Please let my sister Tamar come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I, might, that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent to the house uh, for Tamar, saying, So now, go now to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. Okay? Now, skip down to verse 10. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the bedroom to her brother Amnon. When she brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. Um, and then he goes on in verse 13, As for me, where could I get rid of my reproach? And as for you, you will be like the one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. Now, it's interesting, that last statement there in verse 13 
if you really want me, go ask your dad. Go ask the king. And he'll give you. He'll give me to you. Now, folks, uh, see, that's, I mean, it's a clear violation of the law. But yet Tamar has confidence that in order to make this quote-unquote right, that all Amnon has to do is go to her father, his father, David, her father too, and uh, consummate this marriage or whatever. But that doesn't happen. So Amnon desires Tamar so much, he ends up raping her. Look at verse 14. However, he would not listen to her since he was stronger than she. He violated her and lay with her. Then notice that the lust that he had for her quickly turns. Look at verse 15. Then Amnon hated her with a very great hatred. For the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love for which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up and go away. All right, so he's used her and kicked her out. Isn't that exactly what the opposite of love does? Lust uh, thinks it's got to have it then and there right now, but when it happens, then we see the true effects. True love does not do that. True love does not use people for uh, that kind of situation. So, uh, you've got a bad situation here. You've got a half-brother who has raped his half-sister. Now, go down to verse 20 of chapter 13, and now we're going to see the response of Tamar's brother and her father. Then Absalom said to her, uh, then Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? But now keep silent, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this matter to heart. So Tamar remained and was desolate in her brother's, brother Absalom's house. Now when King David heard of these matters, he was very angry. But Absalom did not speak to Amnon either good or bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Now, the, so here's Absalom basically telling her to not do anything. And then what is the king supposed to be doing? Well, we've read scripture already. He's supposed to take Amnon and they're supposed to kick him out of the community. He's supposed to be cut off, ostracized because of what he's done because even the Bible calls it an abomination. But he doesn't. All he does is get mad. So, as a result of this, we see that unresolved sin and anger can lead to other consequences. Let's continue on. Let's go down to verse 28. Now, here's what's happening. Absalom hated Amnon. You would too. You would be upset, okay, for what he's done to your sister. So in verse 28... Here's Absalom. Absalom commanded his servants, saying, See now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then put him to death. Do not fear, have I not myself commanded you. Be courageous and be uh, valiant. The servant of Absalom did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. Okay? So... Uh, Prince Absalom decides to kill his half-brother Amnon because his father wouldn't do anything about the rape. Okay? Now let's go on down a little further. Because of what happens, obviously uh, David, is that's his oldest son. Okay? And so clearly there's heartache. I mean, he loved his son even though he had committed something very, very wrong. He still loved uh, his son, especially his, his oldest. So, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 37 through 39. Now, Absalom fled after all this happened, and he went to Talmai. Did we hear that word a while ago? Yes, the son of Amenahud, the king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom had fled and gone to Geshur and was there three years. 
The heart of King David longed to go out to Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. Okay? So, um, Absalom goes to his maternal grandfather. That is his maternal grandfather. And he goes to Gersher, and he stays there for three years. Okay? Now, uh, obviously... David loves Absalom, as he had loved his other children as well. So we're going to see that David wants to get Absalom back. So let's go to chapter 14, and let's go down to verses 23 and 24. Skip down a little bit. There's a lot of verses there. And he uses his commander-in-chief, Joab, So in chapter 14, verse 23, So Joab arose and went to Gersher and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. However, the king said, Let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom turned to his own house and did not see the king's face. Okay? So, isn't that kind of strange? It's kind of the opposite of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, when he messes up in life, he says, hey, you know, I'll go back to my father. His father was constantly looking down the road, waiting for his prodigal son to come back. And he couldn't wait to run to him. I I love the, there's a couple of songs that have been written over the years in regards to that passage entitled when God ran that is the time when God ran he ran to his son who was the prodigal hugged him kissed him put on the uh, finest robe and uh, uh, his ring and everything but there you see the prodigal uh, being embraced by his father here you see Absalom basically being put aside there's still problems there folks he's still upset with Absalom He killed his oldest son. And so there's still uh, animosity between them, whatever you want to call it, okay? So David does get Absalom back, but there is no communication, or at least there's not any valuable communication. So this is, you know, Absalom's choice. He he goes out, kills uh, Amnon, and then here he's now back uh, with King David, but there is no communication. Now, Absalom has a scheme. He is upset with his dad. Folks, this is not a good situation. (laughs) I mean, this family, this is dysfunctional with a capital D. Okay? So we're going to look at chapter 14 here. We're going to see what Absalom is going to try to do. He's going to try to scheme right under his father's nose. Look at verses... um, Uh, 25 and 26 of chapter 14, okay? Uh, However, the king said, let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom turned to his own house and did not see the king's face. Verse 25, now in all of Israel was no one as handsome as Absalom. So highly praised from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no defect in him. When he cut the hair uh, of his head, and it was at the end of every year that he cut it, for it was heavy on him, he cut it. It weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels by the king's weight. Folks, that's about three pounds of hair. And I'm a little jealous of that. He was a handsome prince, charming with lots of hair. The girls went gaga for him, okay? He was handsome on the surface. No defect. The, I mean, the writer of, of 2 Samuel gives us this specific uh, nuance about uh, Absalom. Okay? He's handsome, but he has no defect whatsoever. Should have been a model. Okay? So, on the surface, he's handsome. But underneath... He he is tangled up with unresolved sin, resentment, bitterness, and hatred. And there is a fakeness about him. On 
on the outside, everything looks fine. He's handsome. And it look, looks like, hey, man, Absalom's got everything he needs. He's got the women. He's got the looks. But, folks, there was a fakeness about him. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 15. Let's, let's go there for a moment, and let's begin reading in verse 1. Now, it came about that after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate, and when any man had suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And he would say, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land that every man who has any suit or cause would come to me, and I would give him justice. And when a man came near to uh, prostrate himself before him, uh, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. Notice that last phrase. He's got a scheme here, folks. He was a scheming rebel. He's the son of a king. He's the son of David. But he is turned He's turning cold to his father. Their relationship is horrible. He's beginning a plan to actually overthrow his father. Now, let's look at his motives. Absalom had some deep issues concerning his father David. He resented his father not taking care of Amnon's sin against his sister Tamar. If David had not kept him at a distance and had tried to reconcile with the boy or the young man now as it is, maybe things could have been different. In fact, Absalom was even willing to die to be able to know his real dad. Look at chapter 14 and verse 32. Go back just a ways. Absalom answered Job, Behold, I sent for you, saying, Come here, that I may send you to the king to say, Why have I come from Gersher? It would be better for me to still be there. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face, and if there is iniquity in me, let him put me to death. I mean, I came back, and I don't even get to see my dad. Nothing's changed. I should have, I should have just stayed in Gersher. Okay? So Absalom fa fails to connect with his father, and so he uses justice to undermine his father, and uh, as we see here in this passage of Scripture. Now we see Absalom's contempt for David. Absalom started his own little kingdom, and he even goes after one of David's trusted advisors. His name is Ahithophel. Say that three times, and I'll take you to pizza afterwards. Just kidding. Ahithophel, the Gileonite. Know anybody who's named their child Ahithophel lately? Me neither. Okay. Look at 2 Samuel 15 and verse 12. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city Gilon, while he was offering the sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. Absalom is winning the hearts over of the people. Okay. Um. Now, in case you say, well, who's Ahithophel? Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba, with whom David had committed adultery and had her husband Uriah murdered in battle. Uriah was a close friend of Ahithophel's son. Absalom turned a strained relationship between David and Ahithophel to his advantage. Ahithophel is probably disillusioned by David in the first place. He's not done what he's supposed to do as the king. He has uh, certainly sinned against God. He has not done the things that he's supposed to do. He's not been consistent, not been transparent. And so uh, Absalom, you've got to give him credit. He sees an opening. And so uh, he turns Ahithophel to his advantage. 
And folks, get this. David ends up having to flee the palace and return to his wilderness life. But this time it was not Saul, King Saul. It was his own son, Absalom. In fact, Ahithophel gave Absalom some advice. Look at, uh, go over to chapter 16, and I want you to look at something. This is quite interesting. Verses 21 through 23. In verse 21, Ahithophel says to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Then all of Israel will hear that you have made yourself odious to your father. The hands of all who are with you will also be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. I want you to get that, on the roof. And Absalom went in to his father's concubines in the sight of Israel. The advice of Hithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one inquired of the word of God, so that all the advice of Hithophel regarded by both David and Absalom. Does anybody remember how David came to commit adultery with Bathsheba, he was on the roof. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to have been in battle, but he was one king that was not. He's there at his home. He's out on the roof one night, sees Bathsheba, and immediately is, you know, he falls for this, okay? This very thing here, you've got Ahithophel <laughs> going after um, uh, David and so he gives uh, Absalom advice, and it's, it, it, it's just ironic that it comes back in full circle that David uh, has this situation. So um, this prophecy was fulfilled. Do you remember what we read a while ago in chapter 12, verse 11 and 12? Let me go back to it and read it one more time so that you'll remember in chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Hello. Sometimes, folks, the judgment of God can be difficult. But here you have the son of David basically giving payback to his father. How much he must have de de despised his father. Well, we come to the end of this fairy tale. Usually fairy tales end good, don't they? This one doesn't. Let's going to see, we're going to look at Abraham or Absalom's demise. David fought back. Now, you know, give credit, David doesn't just continue to lose and lose and lose uh, his trusted, uh, you know, people. He has uh, troops and advisors who have stuck with him in spite of the situation. And Joab, Joab was David's commander-in-chief, and so new orders are given. Second Samuel chapter 18, and look at verse 3. Excuse me, verse 5. It says, The king charged Joab and, and Abishna and Ita, boy, I'll tell you about these words, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard them when the king charged all the commanders concerning Absalom. Now, obviously, what David wanted, he wanted just to corral him and get him back in. Want to talk some sense in the boy, should have talked some sense into him sooner, but David put him in another place, wouldn't talk to him. So, new orders, and as it turns out, it's Absalom's vanity that ends up being the source of his undoing. Look at verse 9. We're going to read down through verse 15. It says, Now Absalom happened to meet the servants of David, for Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, so that he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him kept going. When a certain man saw it, he told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Then Joab said to the man who had told him, Now behold, you saw him. Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? And I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a belt. The man said to Joab, 
Even if I should receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not put my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king charged you and Abishne and Ita, saving, saying, protect for me the young man Absalom. Otherwise, I've dealt treacherously against his life, and there is nothing hidden from the king. Then you yourself would have stood aloof. Then Joab said, I will not waste time here with you. So he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And the ten young men who carried Joab's armor gathered around and struck Absalom and killed him. Now, this is one of the saddest situations in the Bible. Because if you go on down to verse 33, you're going to see the king's response to all of this. Joab and them were supposed to bring him in. Joab and them said, you know, he's that dangerous, we're going to kill him. So look at verse 33 of chapter 18. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Folks, you can see the grief. You can see the heartache. You can see the what-ifs that are in those statements. The guilt came down on David. I'm sure if David could have said, hey, if I could have just had one more chance with my son, but folks, the time to make things right with those we love is before they die. Then you don't have any problem with what if. Very tragic story. A very difficult family life. A lot of problems. I think we can learn some things, okay? So here's some lessons from this tragic story. I think the first thing that we need to see that an unhappy home produces unbalanced children. Now, David may have been the king of Israel, but he was not the leader of his home. I remember a man who I went to seminary with. He and his wife were good friends. We had been in Bolivar, Missouri together. He was a very uh, smart individual. He made straight A's in seminary. He didn't hardly have to study. He studied a lot anyway, but he didn't have to. He was just that kind of a brainiac. But he had a problem. He and his wife, they came to seminary there in Fort Worth, and, and uh, he had a, a problem with pornography. And as a result, his wife eventually found out and it created issues in the home. And I remember going and talking to him one night because I was a friend. I wasn't there to condemn him. I was there to try to help him and pray for him. And I remember him telling me, making a statement that I've never forgot. He said, Jim, I've been making A's in school, but I've been making F's at home. I thought about that. That was true. He was making A's in school. In fact, the seminary was very surprised because he was such a brilliant student. He would have clearly been a candidate for being, getting a doctorate and possibly even being a seminary professor. But folks, he had a chink in the armor, and as a result, he and his wife ended up getting a divorce. He died several years later. We got to see uh, his wife one time after that before she moved back to uh, Florida. But it was so tragic. Successful at work, but a failure at home. Men, are you cultivating a happy home tonight? Don't lose yourself in your work and end up losing your kids or your family to the world. An unhappy home produces unbalanced children. And you see that in David's family. Secondly, a lack of parental discipline breeds insecurity and resentment in children. And this is where we're going to be fighting the world because the world has told us we can't discipline our children anymore. 
I do not understand. I will never understand it. I, had a, I have a wife who used to teach school. She is now retired. And one of the reasons why she did retire was because of lack of discipline in the classroom. You can't do anything to them anymore. Um, when I was growing up, and I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, saying something that's not true. I'm telling you the truth. I feared Almighty God that my parents, when they went and talked to my teachers, they believed in discipline at home and they believed in discipline in the school. And I remember my mother telling the fourth grade teacher, my fourth grade teacher, her name was Miss Holmes. They called her the witch. She looked like one, but she was actually a pretty good teacher. But I remember her going up there that day and telling my teacher, my dad, she said, my, uh, Jim's dad, Jimmy at the time, Jimmy's dad is, had to go to work. He would like to have come up here and talked to you, but we believe in discipline in the home, and if you end up having to spank little Jimmy, we want you to tell us because he'll get a spanking at home. Folks, that's, that's the absolute truth. If I'm lying, I'm dying. So I knew that if I got in trouble at school, I got in trouble at home. And folks, to think that I could go home and cry to my dad and say, Dad, that teacher didn't treat me very good today. Uh, they were horrible to me. That coach, he did not put me in the game like he should have. Folks, I might as well have been talking to a wall because as far as they concerned, the teacher was always right. Now, I, I know that society has changed, but children need boundaries, and there needs to be consequences when those boundaries are crossed. To discipline your kids or your grandchildren or whoever. Now, grand, you know, grandparents, we're supposed to just spoil them and send them home. But uh, some of you have had to help raise. We've had to help raise our granddaughter uh, for several years. But listen, to discipline our children, our grandchildren, is scriptural. Are we going to sit here and allow the world to basically go against scripture? God says in Hebrews, God disciplines those whom he loves. And the same concept is there. Parents who discipline their children prove they love them. So, a lack of parental discipline breeds insecurity and resentment in kids. And folks, kids, I believe most kids, I'm not saying all of them, but I believe most of them, they want some boundaries. They want somebody to put the parameters there. And then they're going to test you to see if, they're, if you really mean business. And I believe if we do mean business, we would see better things happen in our schools and in our homes. But until we come back to that, there is no hope in the home. The third thing, failure to repair a broken relationship infl inflicts wounds that never heal. I read this story in uh, Swindoll's book, and it was so riveting that I want to share it with you tonight. And uh, let me just share with you the context. Uh, Dr. Swindoll, who I believe probably, I'm, I'm going to guess, he doesn't say, but he pastored in Fullerton, California, and he also is in uh, Texas. He's in um, just outside of Dallas there, between Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, he was having to counsel a family much like David's situation. So here we go. The father was extremely busy making a lot of money. His girls and his one boy soon sensed that his business meant more to him than they did. And so they began to live cheap, sensual, compromising lives that, didn't even bother to, that they didn't even bother to conceal. The behavior of those children became so notorious that the testimony of the church came under criticism by the community. So I had to visit the family at their home. 
Now listen to this. At one point, I had to break up a fist fight between two of the girls after they had brought down the dining room chandelier and knocked a shutter off a window. The mother sat there wringing her hands, muttering, I just don't know what I am going to do with these children. Obviously, the relationships between each member of this family had been broken for a very long time, if ever there had been any to begin with. At the age of 42, the father's heart stopped beating long enough to cause significant brain damage. By most standards, he was dead, although his body lingered for some time at the veterans' hospital. As the children visited, hoping for some sign that there might be a chance for reconciliation. Did you get that? The grief mounted as his condition declined, and finally he died. The dismal atmosphere of remorse and profound heartache that filled the mortuary made it almost impossible to breathe. The father had departed emotionally long before his tragic end. He left his children with no moral guidance. He left his wife to fill the role of both parents. He left his family with no reason to think that they were important and loved. And he left them with no way to heal the deep, emotional wounds that they both suffered and inflicted. Unfo uh, ultimately, he left them to make it on their own. For years, the lingering wounds have continued to afflict the man's children. I don't know if they will ever have a normal relationship with a mate or their children or anyone intimate. Folks, that's a tragedy. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Loses his soul. I'd say, paraphrase, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his family? I can't take my riches to heaven, folks. Tank, can't take my cars, can't take my house, can't take my bank account. But I can make sure that my family, I can do everything I can for my family to love Jesus that one day they will be there. That's the reason why stories like this are in the Bible, okay? So, we've got some things here that we have learned. I hope Absalom, is, you know, uh, again, so much promise, so much that he could have done in his life, but because of the broken relationships and everything that went on in the family, it ended up a tragedy. Let's pray that that doesn't happen in our families, okay? Let's do everything we can. Let's love God with all of our heart. Let's, let's, um, let's not at any point put in the minds of our children or our grandchildren that they don't know where we stand when it comes to loving Jesus. Pull them down, uh, put, set them down this coming Thanksgiving and um, let them know how much you love them and let them know how much you love God. And, and I'm just going to say this because I've, I've been there, folks. If you've got a relationship that is broken, I promise you, better to deal with the hurt and the difficulties now than for that person to pass away. And you never get the opportunity. I've had people sit in my office languishing over what ifs. Okay? So let's remember that tonight. I want us to stand to our feet. We're going to pray together. Appreciate your faithfulness tonight. Father, please forgive us when we stray. We are not sinless, but we should sin less. Lord, we as dads and fathers, we have a tremendous responsibility in being the spiritual leader. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be examples. And Father, forgive us when we are not. Lord, I pray for the wives here tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to just be what you've called them to be in, that, in the home. 
Lord, we have some single parent, possibly some single parent families. We know that we have them within our church. And Lord, it's not fair. It's not the ideal situation. But Lord, would you use that single parent to help with those kids? Lord, help us as a church family to do everything we can to be in, an encouragement to children. Lord, desperately today, we're seeing more and more. We're seeing dysfunctional families. We're seeing families where there's not even a dad anywhere near in the home that is any kind of an example. Father, forgive us as a nation. We cannot survive if we continue to unravel when it comes to the home. Give us Christian dads and moms. Give us Christian grandparents who love Jesus. And Father, help us to lean not on our own understanding, but to trust in you. You said that you would guide our paths and make them straight. We need that today. Father, be with teachers. Lord, I know what it's like to live with a teacher who gets frustrated when there is no discipline and there doesn't seem to be any support from those who are in authority. And I realize administrators today are being uh, threatened with lawsuits. You touch my child, I'm going to sue. Father, give us back. Give us back that sense of discipline that we need. Let it begin with the parents. And then, Father, help them to show it with their kids. Lord, I pray for each and every family here tonight. We, we are not perfect. But, Father, I believe you still are for the family. And that is going to be the key. We'll make or break this nation in the home. Father, help us. We need your help. Go with us from this place. Help us to be examples to this world. Again, forgive us where we fail you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.